the Keto and Crime and Doc Crime. Today I've got another Keto and Crime Classic. Um, Saturday, April 3rd is my birthday, so I'm going to take that off to spend with my family. But I wanted to make sure I got a video out to you. I'm still working on the Mary Bell, but it will be out. Not Sunday, it will be out Monday, Tuesday of next week. So you, it is under works, it's just taking a bit longer because I'm finishing the book and other things, still working on it. So. That will be out, but I still wanted to get something out to you on Saturday, so I decided to go ahead and do another Keto and Crime Classic. This one focuses on 2017's Fire Festival. It was an actual, it was a two-parter when I originally did it, but I'm going to kind of meld them together into one longer episode. This is going to be a longer episode. It's going to be about an hour. So I hope you guys enjoy it, guys and girls enjoy it. So basically the Fire Festival was a festival put on by Billy McFarland, who had some dubious uh, business uh, businesses that were borderline scams, possibly scams prior to the 2017 Fire Festival, and uh, 90s, early 2000s rapper Ja Rule. So you know this is going to end up being a great thing. <laughs> it wasn't. It, it, it was a total failure, and there's still a huge amount of controversy about whether it was a scam or just something that got out of control. It was also tied to another business venture by John Rule and Billy McFarlane known as Fire App. It was going to kind of be the Uber of celebrity booking. That never came to fruition. And then he was later convicted of lying about the income and profits of that company. So all this kind of culminates in this video. And I talk about his past and the Fire Festival and what happened afterwards. Yes, there were two documentaries about this, one produced by Hulu, one on Netflix, that were produced by two different people involved in the Fire Festival. Uh, the Netflix documentary was produced by a Jerry Media, who was trying to spin it their way, because they did all the PR for it, and then there was uh, the Net Hulu kind of an independently produced, that kind of came from Billy McFarlane's side. So if you've seen those, you have a great background for what I'm about to talk about. But I hope you enjoy it. I think it's one of the better videos that I've done, even though it was one of my first. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I hope you enjoyed it. So, let's go back in the Wayback Machine to 2019 Tracy, talking about 2017's Fire Festival. Hey everyone, Keto Comic here with my long promised White Collar Wednesday crime story. We're going to talk about the infamous Fire Festival today, and I anticipate this possibly being more than one part. I don't want to go over like 30 to 40 minutes with any video because YouTube kind of frowns on that, and also I know people's attention span aren't that long. So if I put out part one today, part two will come out tomorrow and onward and so forth if I need more parts, but I don't think it'll take more than two. But uh, let's get into it. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Fire Festival, but it was a festival put on by a young man named Billy McFarlane partnering with 90s rapper J. Rule, back, or Ja Rule, back in 2017 to promote his Fire app, and it turned out to be one of the biggest disasters and social media flops of the century. And there's been two documentaries produced about it, one on Netflix and one on Hulu, both from two different uh, views. We'll talk about that toward the end, but I just wanted to give an overall analysis as well as an anal my analysis of Billy McFarland himself as to why this may have happened. So let's uh, get into it. Fire Festival. All right, everyone. Billy McFarland. William Z. McFarlane, and I could not find out what the Z stood for. William Z. McFarlane was born December 11th, 1991, Melbourne, New, Jer New Jersey. He was uh, born to Stephen and Irene McFarlane, both real estate developers. He actually did pretty well in school, was kind of a geek and that sort of thing, but he actually started his first visit, uh, business at the age of 13. Uh, I could not find the name of that business, but it was basically an online platform, early online platform, 
for matching developers to websites. Websites that needed work, he could match a developer to it. So it was actually a pretty ingenious thing for, especially for a 13 year old to come up with. So it's obvious this guy was going, was setting himself up to be a serial entrepreneur. So at the age of 13 to be able to do that, it's awesome. He ran that for a couple of years after it was closed. He actually used part of that money to pay part of his way to Bucknell, which is a pretty nice business school where he started uh, in 2010, only to drop out in 2011 to start Spling, his first business as an adult. And it was an early online digital advertising space. Basically, it would match people to good online advertising and help them target that toward the people they wanted to reach. So it was it was an early advertising campaign platform. So again, he dropped out of Bucknell Business School, did not graduate to start that. So again, we see, so as we can see, there's a pattern of serial entrepreneurship starting to form here. So he really likes to be in charge. He really likes to be in charge of his own business. And it's just a little bit later on when we see that start to get perverted. Instead of starting legitimate businesses, he starts to swerve into not so legitimate businesses and then into actual outright scams, which was right before he went to prison. So let's let's talk about that. Now, after he dropped out to start Spling, he ran that for a couple of years up until about 2013. And decided to close Spling down and try to start some other businesses. But about this time, he started becoming fascinated. All right, so after he dropped out of Bucknell and started Spling, he ran that to about 2013. And then along those lines, he had become kind of obsessed with Aubrey McClendon, who was the entrepreneur that started Chesapeake Energy Company. It was a huge provider of both natural gas, oil, fossil fuels, and green energy in the early 2000s. So he became obsessed with this guy, Aubrey McClendon, and sort of considered him a mentor of sorts. They, they were able to connect, and um, Aubrey actually gave him a huge, I think, three to five million dollar investment to start his very first company outside of Spling, and that was Magnesis, which we're about to talk about. But Aubrey was giving him advice, giving him money. And the kicker is that Aubrey was killed in 2016 in an auto accident in which the reports say that he was going 80 miles an hour when he hit a, a literal embankment wall. So going 80 miles an hour and slamming right into a wall, people were wondering if it might not have been suicide because the day before he was indicted on several counts of rigging oil and energy prices through Chesapeake. So as you can see, Aubrey was a legitimate businessman, but then kind of ran some scams himself. And Billy McFarlane really looked up to this. So you can see kind of the groundwork being laid there. But Billy was devastated when his uh, mentor died in 2016, as it's to be expected, no matter what a person is, even if they are a scammer, you do tend to love and admire them. So that doesn't matter as far as their relationship went. But Aubrey McClendon was not always on the up and up. And this was a person that Billy McFarlane considered a titan of industry and somebody he wanted to be. So as we just said, he donated three to five million dollars for McFarland's very first business outside of Spling, and that was Magnesis. Now here I have a couple of black cards. These are not actual Magnesis cards, but they're the closest I could find. Basically what, Mag what Magnesis was, was an idea that Billy got when he was out to dinner with a lot of his friends and noticed the plethora of different credit cards that were being thrown on the table. And he said, why can't I consolidate that and have everybody of a certain socioeconomic status and a certain age on the very same card. So he was trying to target millennials with a lot of disposable income, whether they were wealthy or just had their parents' money. He wanted their money. So what he came up with was the Magnesis Black card. And it wasn't an actual credit card in the true sense of the term as it's tied to a bank or to a 
a bank that will lend you a line of credit or to a bank account where you have money that gets debited. It was what we call a second tier card or a middleman card. Basically what it did, it was a black card and it was heavy and it had it was made of metal just like the American Express black card. American Express black card is an invitation only credit card that has no credit limit and you can literally do anything with it. Well, it was kind of mimicking that. And what it did was link to whatever other credit card you may have. So you took this card, you went online, you set up an account, and you linked your actual credit card to this black card, and then you had the prestige of carrying a black card. So he was targeting moneyed millennials, people that were born after 1984 up into like 1997. Those people, he was targeting them for the prestige. and. So you linked these two credit cards together. On top of that, you paid a $250 a year membership that not only allowed you to use that card, but gave you exclusive access to Billy's West Village Manhattan Loft and a suite at one of the biggest hotels in Manhattan for use by appointment, but you had access to this to come party. It also gave you exclusive access to hard to get tickets, sold out shows, uh, exclusive meet and greets, concert tickets, whatever you might want. This card gave you ex exclusive access to those through a concierge service. And by two 2017, he was accused of fraud in this business. And the fraud in this business was kind of twofold. A, he was just defrauding you by taking 200. This is not necessarily a fraud in the true sense of the word fraud, as he was charging you $250 to essentially use your own credit card through another card that he gave you that was just a little more rich looking. So that wasn't a fraud in the true criminal sense, but it was kind of a questionable business practice, business model. But basically what was happening, he was charging people a small fee on their card whenever he got them the exclusive tickets or whatever that they wanted. So he was charging them that he wasn't telling them up front they would be charged more than what they were willing what they were told they would have to pay for the exclusive tickets but he was also charging them an overage so that he made a profit without telling them without laying this out in the contract so these people were getting statements from Magnesis saying they owed a hundred dollars two hundred dollars three hundred dollars whatever that may be in addition to what was already in his contract so that was fraud number one fraud number two was that he was basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. People would order these exclusive tickets and pay for them, and then he wouldn't get them because he was using that money to pay other bills. When they would pay $400 for a, tick, a sold out uh, ticket to Hamilton, the Broadway show, for example, which was big at the time, they would pay $400 for that ticket, and he would put off getting the ticket, put off getting the ticket, because he put that $400 with other money to pay for the last batch of expensive tickets that he got. So let's say before Hamilton, he was getting people floor seats to the Knicks game. All right, so he was taking the Hamilton money and paying off his credit card that he used to get the Knicks tickets and putting off he had to get that credit card, other credit card paid off to pay for the Hamilton tickets to give them to these people. So he was paying off that credit card so he could get enough credit to buy these new tickets and then get them to the people. So lots of times, people it would be the day of the event and people weren't still didn't have their tickets. So they were, of course, emailing the concierge, calling the customer service line. No one was getting any responses. And so what would happen when he finally had enough credit on that credit card after he paid it down? to get those tickets, he would call StubHub or some other place and pay an exorbitant amount of money for them, buy them all, and then he would literally send out an email to the people that had bought them telling them to be at the theater, 6.30 p.m., and he would just stand out front, hand out tickets, just hand out tickets willy-nilly and get them in. So that's kind of the business he ran. That's kind of the business he ran. It was kind of a robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of scenario, and of course, that with the the fees that he wasn't telling people that he had that he was going to charge actually caused people to start filing lawsuits and questioning. So by 2017, Magnesis was in big, big trouble. So we can see a pattern here forming. A legitimate business idea and then kind of devolved because he didn't know how to run the business into 
fraud. And some people say he ran it pretty good up until Aubrey McClendon was killed, but there were patterns that, of people that I read. Now, this is all hearsay, of course. You know, of course, that's what testimony is, hearsay. But this was all from court transcripts and everything else where he was, from the very beginning, didn't have the money to properly vet this. And then he got sued by the owners of the loft because he trashed it. And it was just a lot of stuff. So by 2017, Magnesis was in big trouble and he needed another business. All right, so by 2017, Magnesis is in big trouble. So he comes up with yet another business idea. He basically shuts Magnesis down. He had already expanded beyond New York to Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and was running into similar issues. So he just shut Magnesis down. And I think there are still lawsuits pending to this day about Magnesis, but it was gone. So he decided he needed another business venture. So he was always a well-spoken young man that could talk people into things. You know, most, a lot of people that are good for sales are like that. Not necessarily that they're fraudsters, but he just had that kind of personality. So what he was able to do is talk to a lot of different investors and pitch an idea he had for what he called the Uber or the Tinder of booking. So basically, if you wanted Beyonce to play at your son's birthday party, you could get it through his app, which he called Fire App. So you could get that service through that for an extra fee that the app would take, much like you get a ride from an independent driver through Uber. You pay that driver's fare plus extra through the app. That's kind of what Fire was. So he was able to put that together and pitch it to people enough to get a development team together that was willing to work on it and to get developer developers and investors to come in on it. One of them was Corolla James, who was married to one of the biggest hedge fund owners in New York. And if you don't know what a hedge fund is, it's basically a fund that people kind of co cohesively and collaboratively invest in that will hedge your bets on other stocks, kind of keep you from taking a huge loss. So it's a, kind of like a mutual fund, but with some other protections built in. But her husband owned that, and she was, she came in for several million dollars on Fire, on Fire App. But the problem was he was telling people that he had already made $20 million with this app, and that he had all these different artists signed up. And he had Ja Rule, who was real popular from the 90s, as his spokesman for that. So he was able to pitch a really good front, but... He forged all these documents to show he, he had like $5 million worth of uh, stake in Facebook. He had $20 million in business already on Fire App when really he had done less than $60,000 in business on Fire App. And his shares in Facebook actually totaled about $1,500. So that's what, with those kind of lies, he was able to lure people in. And he had actually been planning this app since 2016. And had, he and Ja Rule had actually talked about it at the 2016 FX web conference about how this was going to revolutionize booking. And again, just like his ideas in college and before the uh, idea of matching developers with websites and digital advertising was a really solid, great idea, but unfortunately for him, it got, just like Magnesis, it got way out of control for him. But, so they promoted it, so they were working on this app that had some success, booked about $60,000 in business, which isn't jump change, it isn't much in Manhattan, but it's not jump change either. So they decided they wanted a way to really blow out promotion for this app. So there came the idea for an exclusive luxury music festival based on music, art, food, all the all the big shebang aimed again at moneyed millennials that would promote Fire App and the Spire Festival was was his brainchild. So he and Ja Rule promoted it at conferences and decided they were going to pull this off just a few months so they decided they were going to market it exclusively online with social media and for that they hooked up with uh jerry media who used to be the all the rage on social media now they're gone but they had a uh, page called bleep jerry and i'm going to let you fill in the the f word that goes there because i don't want to get demonetized but that was one of their main pages so they hired them 
to help them promote this festival. And they wanted to do it, like I said, entirely on social media without paying for any other type of advertising. So what they did was take a group of the biggest influencers at the time, uh, uh, Haley Bieber, who married a Justin Bieber model that's married to Justin Bieber, and honestly, this is how far out of sync I am. I didn't even know Justin Bieber was married. I thought he was still in, with Selena Gomez and closeted gay. I honestly thought that. So I didn't even realize he was married. So her. They also got Bella Hadid. They got a bunch of really big Instagram and runway models to promote this. They took them all to the Bahamas and they had them spend a week on the beach just frolicking, swimming with the feral pigs, uh, doing all this stuff. And they filmed it and put together this brilliant marketing commercial for it. And then they paid these influencers, the same ones, uh, Bieber, Hadid, they even got Kendall Jenner to do one post, which cost them $250,000. But basically, they got them to market it Fire Festival with just an orange block on social media. Now think about it, especially particularly on Instagram. You're scrolling, you're scrolling, you're scrolling, you're seeing all these great pictures, boo, 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 and then orange block. Just thing of orange. You're going to stop and look at that. So when people stopped and looked at it, they would click and they would be sent into this video that showed these beautiful, you know, crystal blue waters with uh, beautiful beaches and all that all that around it and so people were drawn in they're like they weren't just selling a music festival because to me when i go to like bonnaroo or cma fest or something like that music festival for me means you're sitting outside you might be camping it's not exactly super comfortable the food's not the best but with this they were selling a luxury experience so they were booking frolicking with people you wanted to be around models uh rich people on a beautiful Caribbean paradise and they promoted it as if it was going to be on a private island in the Bahamas that was once owned by Pablo Escobar. I mean that's how much they were pro promoting it and you were going to have these gorgeous villas or hotel or yacht packages where you would be staying and you would have all your food taken care of and it was going to be luxury food like star catering which he's one of the biggest caterers to the stars he owns several five-star restaurants and he was going to provide just the best food possible so you had all that so of course most people are going to book that that wouldn't normally book a music festival but because it was a luxury experience they decided they wanted to go so april 28th through 30th may 5th through 7th 2017 on a private beach once owned by pablo escobar in the bahamas near great exuma fire festival was promoted but the problem with that whole private island they wanted like 10 or twenty thousand people to come well that island would only hold hold about two or three thousand people so and they got into a dispute with the owner because he told them not to mention pablo escobar well that was the first one of the first thing they mentioned in that video so you're out of here. So now they had to move Fire Festival from that private island actually onto Great Exuma. But the issue with issue number one with that is April 28th through 30th was their Grand Regatta weekend, and it's a huge boat race where all these people from the uh, Pacific Islands come in and just to race boats, and it's like a Super Bowl there. So every single room that was po could possibly be booked there was booked. All the Sandals Resorts were booked, all the hotels were booked, all the Airbnbs were filled up. And that was warning number one from Billy's team to him. His uh, team consisted of mainly his staff at Fire Media and uh, contractors that he brought in. All of them were telling him, you need to change the weekend. He wouldn't. So now we're getting set up for what could be a potential disaster. So they rebooked the festival on the island of Great Exuma at Ro Roker's Point outside Sandals Resort to host this fire festival. Now to start he did take bids on what we call festivals in a box. These companies that can come in, one of them is called DPC, the other is called C CGE I believe, but don't quote me on that. 
he got quotes from both of them on how much it would cost to put this festival on in four months because he started promoting it at the end of December uh, 2016 and took the marketing on into January of 2017 so he had like four months to put this on now most festivals especially on an island like Great Exuma that's not well wired for a huge amount of people you know there's no electricity no sanitation not enough for that kind of people they're gonna have to do all this from scratch so he did bring in two companies to kind of do a festival in a box just to set it up all inclusively one said they could do it in a month but it they required 50 million dollars and he had only budgeted something like 20 million dollars for this thing so out the door with them second one told him they could do it for 35 million but it would take a year out the door with them so what happened is he started contacting people that he knew could run festivals could do um, hospitality had customer service experience in addition to his developers that were working double shifts at fire app to help him so he started bringing all these people he brought in um, the person that did 90s fest he brought in the person that has ran the new york gay pride parade for 10 years he people that could put on huge events he started bringing in these people so it was just a network of loosely connected contractors that were going to put this thing on in four months and with that to set the uh, pace for exactly what we're looking at here this is the actual marketing deck or slideshow presentation that um, Billy and Grant would use to woo investors for the fire festival and he did this to, in an effort to raise all the money he could he actually raised 26.4 million dollars for fire and like I said he had set a budget for 20 million so I know things go over budget but my goodness but as you can see it's just a nice little marketing deck kind of showing you know the athletes musicians everything that was going to be there he had booked some major acts like uh, blink well I say major acts blink 182 I mean they were big when I was in my 20s I don't think I would have paid thousands of dollars to go see them and then they had he had some DJs like major laser some other people but but the first big hurdle that he didn't actually think about was something that Mark Weinstein brought out is that when you run a festival you have to expect that 80 to 90 percent of your ticket sales what you charge for tickets are going to have to go to pay your talent because when you book a band he says you have to pay pretty much their whole booking fee up front unless you have a long-term relationship with them in which case they might let you just do half and then pay them half after but this is a brand new festival these guys had absolutely no experience booking talent despite what they said about making 20 million dollars on a fire app on the fire app the booking app because that was a lie they'd only made less than 60,000 so they didn't really have the experience they needed so they hired one of the top booking agencies in Manhattan who was charge of booking all the concerts clubs everything around the city and they actually went out of business as a result of their ties to this festival but so they teamed up with them to actually book the talent and they did end up having to pay the full amount of everyone's booking fee up front well for some the big acts that they were booking that could be a hundred two hundred you know five hundred thousand dollars so that was their first big expense that they didn't really think through so they were you know prodding who had joined up even before they really had secured them so this is the deck as you can see it's all luxury general admission was a few hundred dollars then you had some more affordable you know affordable all-inclusive packages all the way up to 1200 and then ultimate luxury packages in excess of a hundred thousand dollars for like a small group of people so you know the general admission you five hundred dollars or so you paid that you still had to pay your own way to the festival you had to um, rent your own hotel room or villa or whatever and that was just general admission you, then everything you bought at the festival was an additional charge drinks food whatever and then you had these luxury pack packages which start at twelve hundred which supposedly was a lot of that all-inclusive which if you think about it, it's a good better deal but he was promising people things that he couldn't deliver like houses that would hold eight people uh 
sleeping on a, a, a yacht or, you know, these really fancy tents. So as you can see, they were just definitely in over their head. But as you can see, they were from a ultimate luxury food by Star Catering, uh, eight and nine people villas, even like the tents that they showed people were like better than any tent I've ever seen. Because, you know, I'm not going to a festival like this because I'm buying a so sausage poor. But there's like these beautiful tents with all these lavish furnishings and carpet and things like that for two to three people on the beach. So even the lowest like $1,200 package was pretty nice, but you can see how it was sold. And this was all purely to invest investors. This wasn't, this particular day, it was not sent out. It was, you know, way more than a, a fest, a music festival. It was just a luxury experience. And this was what was sent out to investors to help them raise the money they need. They were wanting up to 40,000 people, but in the end, only 5,000 were sold, but at some of the prices, that's still an, you know, an exorbitant amount of money. And here is some of the musical acts. You had good music, which is actually uh, uh, Keon, uh, Kanye West's music company. So you had some of his artists coming. So you can imagine that the the booking fees were well over a few million dollars. Well over a few million dollars. So, so in short, this is the image they sold everybody about how luxurious this festival was going to be. And in the end, well, we're going to see what they got, but this is kind of what they sold. And you can see here, a nice big private jet, which they actually did deliver on, but they told everybody it was a private jet, which in my mind is like no more than 12 people on a jet that is owned by the person that lets you fly on it. But what they got was just a chartered, a couple of chartered 737s with the Fire Festival logo on it which I'm not going to shake my stick at that, but they actually said private, not chartered. What they should have said is just chartered plane down. But anyway, and we all know what they got. This is what they got. They got, here is the actual map of Roker's Point where they actually set up camp. And as you can see, it is nicely laid out with all these villas and tents all around, but it was just outside. A, set, uh, a sandals resort. Now, they never really told anyone that the private island was a no-go. They just sort of didn't mention it. And so that was the first clue that all this construction was going on on Great Exuma instead of some private island. But, you know, they were wanting twenty to 40,000 guests to, to come. So that island, plus the fact they made the owner mad, that was just not an option anymore. But they just didn't mention it. So, one of the people that was very prominent in the documentation that I studied said that his job was to find houses for everybody, you know, room and board for everybody that was coming. This included 250 of those same Instagram influencers that he had used to market it. And they were actually giving them a free ride to the festival. So that's like 250 people right there out of the 5,000 that bought tickets that were not paying at all, that were pure expense. And then you had another you know, 4,750 people that you had to actually find rooms for, different types of rooms, not just a single room tent. You had to find, you know, villas, yachts, things. They even, uh, he combed the island looking for any Airbnbs that were left, any hotel rooms that were left, nothing was left. So he basically just started using a couple of locals to go around and basically knock on doors and see if somebody wanted to rent their house for these two weekends. And he found, I think he said, 50 houses that people were willing to let people. Now, these were just houses. He didn't inspect these houses. So these could have been, you know, termite ridden, you know, ready to fall over houses at a luxury festival. But he decided just to book them sight on, unseen. And the, all, of course, as you can imagine, all the people wanted to be paid up front. And this is where the the trouble began because they were quickly running out of cash. Like I said, they had Corolla James who had actually come down to help organize the event. They were always kind of needling her for more money. You had um, Billy flying to New York literally once a week and coming back with two or three million dollars from pitching people. But what people quickly begin realizing is that he didn't have the 26 million dollars that 
he had already it had already been gone probably on his lavish lifestyle so he was really hurting for money um because he had to pay the booking fees of the artists up front which some of them were not paid then now he had the problem having to pay for all this housing up front and he also had star catering which he thought he was going to be able to get for a couple of million their final bill ended up being closer to six million and then you had things that he didn't consider like customs the government of the bahamas are going to want to be paid for all this influx into their government into their government into their country so basically you had tariffs and import fees to the tune of about a million and a half so you had all of this stuff plus just the major cost of completely building a city because as i said at roker's point it really wasn't set up for an influx of that many people so there was not there was limited sanitation there was limited water there was limited electricity so he basically had to go in and build all that infrastructure well companies that actually do that won't you know wanted five to ten million dollars to do that he didn't want to pay that so instead of pushing the festival off or canceling the festival or just you know which would have been a less of a PR nightmare than it was he hired day laborers to do all this work so basically he hired uh, up to like I think it was 500 day laborers that were constantly there working doing things like putting sand down putting up porta potties putting up these tents which are what most of the people got uh, these are leftover rescue tents from FEMA from some of the hurricanes this is what they got and one local, Marianne Rawlings, who, own, who owns the Exuma Point Bar and Grill, which is still there and has great ratings, he contracted with her to feed all of his, all of his staff, all of the day laborers, all the contractors, all of his regular staff that were there. And she racked, she had people working 24 hours a day, racked up a huge bill that, of course, was never paid. But we'll get into that at the end so he was having to feed all these people pay all these people his bill for day laborers was estimated somewhere between 250 and 300 thousand dollars a day to pay all these contractors and day laborers that were basically just doing what they knew how to do to set up a city there was no plan behind it it was just kind of whatever and the plan that was any of the plans that were behind it was just kind of willy-nilly so because Billy was concentrating on finding more money and the gentleman in charge of all the housing because he was still struggling he would send email after email to Billy to Grant and to Corolla who was their chief financer about the cluster that housing was becoming that he couldn't find enough houses he couldn't build enough tents and it was just going to be a disaster and that canceling would be a far better option than allowing this disaster to go down and they actually told him to shut up uh, they billy and grant came and talked to him and said that his emails were making corolla their chief financer nervous and that it was screwing them on getting more money out of her because who wants to put more money into a sinking ship but so in the end after much begging as a solution to at least the influencer problem which they had 250 unpaid people coming he was begging him to cancel those people but they actually rented a yacht a yacht that could hold 300 people at the cost of about five hundred and fifty thousand dollars to anchor off the coast of the bahamas because when it got there it was too big for the dock so they couldn't actually let it just rest at the dock where people could just go you know, go and come so they actually had to have an anchor about a mile off the shore and would have to get boats motor boats to take people back and forth so that was his solution to the influencers we're just going to put all of you on a yacht a cruise ship basically out in the middle of the ocean that's where you're going to stay and then when it's time to come in for the music we're just going to have these power boats that are going to take you that was their solution to the housing and then everybody else we're going to put them in whatever houses we have plus these tents and every day there was just it's, people said there seemed to be a new problem and cash was running low because eventually even Billy's magic had had stopped because news sorry about that 
News about the disaster that the festival was becoming was leaking. There was an actual website dedicated to lambasting the festival called Fire Fraud, and it was leaking pictures from the site outside to stop the festival. So you had these people, they were fighting against that kind of negative press, but they were also kind of lying to Jerry Media about what was going on. And uh, so Jerry Media actually sent some people down there to investigate about oh, two weeks before the festival to see what was going on. And they told their bosses that yes, it is the disaster that the people on the line are saying that it is. We need to stop promoting it. But Jerry Media was already so deep into it, they didn't put out a statement about it. They just continued to promote it heavily to sell more tickets to get more money in. So it has totally gone. If they did start out to do a legitimate festival, it has totally devolved into a, a scam at this point. So about two weeks before the festival, they had two big issues. One, the uh, Bahamas government impounded all their drinking water and because of the tariffs on it and the import fees had not been paid and star catering because Billy kept trying to talk them down, talk them down on their price and also they had not been paid, pulled out. So they have no food, no water, no drinking water at this point. So basically they're screwed. So they go out somehow and they find a caterer to come in at the last minute who they've never released the name of this caterer and, and I wouldn't because if, if you know the story, you know the kind of food they were serving. So they got this one caterer to come in for their original budget of a million dollars and they were able to pay off, somehow rob the coffers and pay off the Bahaman government to get their water. So they got past that, but we're getting down to the couple of weeks before the actual festival so desperate for cash they decide they're going to make this festival cashless and so they come up with these little bracelets that are digital where everybody will put their money on this digital account they'll just scan their bracelets at all the bars because, but the deal is there was no really not enough wi-fi to do that they said this hadn't been tested this was just a last minute idea to get more money to finish paying for the festival so basically they sent out these emails and they had people call from Jerry, uh, Jerry Media and Fire Media to people that had tickets urging them to put money on these bracelets because there won't be any cash accepted or other credit cards accepted. So this is your wallet for the weekend. So you need to load it. And they were telling people to load it for expect about $300 a day. But if you wanted to take part in any of the luxury experiences like massages, like yoga, like fishing like jet skiing you might want to load a lot more than that so not only have these people paid thousands of dollars for their tickets now they were telling them to load all this cash but it worked because they got between 800 thousand and one million dollars on the bracelets and they of course took that money immediately and used it to finish paying for the festival now day of the festival People start to arrive. People start to arrive, and already you've got some influencers tweeting. Austin Mills is one of the biggest ones. He's a guy from uh, Twitter and Instagram that are and YouTube that are really big. Started tweeting their entire experience. It all started when people started arriving in Miami, which was the jump-off point for the festival, and their plane kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed, and finally they got on the plane. You know, three hours after they were supposed to to head down, they all noted it was a very cheap 737 was not a private plane at all, but like I said, it, it's a plane, it'll get you there. But turns out what was going on, a lot of the contractors and companies that had been hired to deal with that side of the business had started to pull out because they hadn't been paid. And some of them had been paid fraudulently. What, what do you mean, instead of actually paying them by check or cash or credit card, he was giving them wire transfers, which is not an unusual way to do business. And a lot of people would do business based on the a wire confirmation number that they were given a specific amount of money for a wire you know it was in your account based on this wire transfer so a lot of people were doing business based on that but the deal is if you get one of those genuinely you're supposed to get the money within 24 to 48 hours at the latest there were people that had had these wire transfers 5 10 15 days still no money so they were realizing these were the people that had the houses this was the 
uh, cruise ship and yacht owner. This was the airline people. This was the caterers. This was everybody. Uh, still had not gotten their money. And one of his staff members, Mark, actually discovered by going on his computer and looking that he was actually doctoring wire transfer like the screen that you get when you do a transfer he would pull up an old one and actually photoshop the numbers and change the numbers so he was just delaying and the people that he actually paid were actually kind of skeptical because instead of getting the exact money that they were supposed to get with the exact wire transfer number they would get the money they were promised but the wire transfer number would be different so a lot of people were starting to get skeptical and then you had the day laborers that hadn't been paid and they were wanting their money and so he finally uh, people started to arrive for the festival they weren't even done you know putting the festival grounds together this is literally still what it looked like and you've got you know the first of over 4,000 people arriving so what they did was send them all to Marianne's Exuma Point Bar and Grill to have lunch and to drink they gave out free tequila got everybody snuckered and then brought them by yellow bus to the campground and then there's all kinds of videos all over about how that went that's kind of history but it didn't go over well and in the end, there was not even any organization as part of checking people in and actually signing people tents. So it was just a free for all for the tents. And a looting mentality took over and people were poking holes in each other's tents, stealing stuff, um, stealing people's luggage because all the luggage was brought in in two big 18 wheeler truck uh, trunk casings that just basically came in at dark and dumped everybody's luggage. Good luck finding your bag. So basically what happened after that, the major people fled the scene. Billy took off, left. Um, they actually had to sneak some of the other executives out because the day laborers were literally looking for blood. The only thing that saved some of the people was this got help get the people because they, Billy was, took off and was just going to leave them there. But the government inter intervened the u.s embassy intervened and let them know that if you bring people to a foreign to foreign soil under a false pretense or any pretense and that doesn't go over it is your responsibility to get people back to the united states in safety so there was that problem that they had to fly these people home so a few of the people did stay over to register to book airline flights re charter airline flights regular airline flights and boat trips to get all of these people, the real over 2,000 people that were still on the island, to back to Miami. So with all the social media, it just evolved. And I have an opinion on that. You know, a lot of people are like, this is for rich people. Rich people get their due. It's funny. I'm going to laugh. But not all these people were rich. Some of these were just kids or single moms or somebody like that had saved money and wanted a luxury experience so they weren't all you know entitled Millennials at all so they get everybody back to Miami of course everybody gets roasted online Billy Ja Rule uh, everybody gets roasted online and then lawsuits start start getting filed both public and private a lot of the people that bought tickets wanted their money back so they got together and did a class action lawsuit against Billy and Ja Rule and then the government got involved because of the fraud like the wire transfers that was the major fraud that he did so all, all people like that started getting involved and not only that it brought about some huge changes in social media advertising because all of these some of these influencers that had promoted it were also named in these lawsuits because none of them had even indicated that it was a paid advertisement they just said oh we're going we were there last year it was fun that's kind of the image that they were portrayed none of them even said this was an advertisement so a lot of them got out of the lawsuits by saying that they thought it was understood it was an advertisement but but it did lay down the groundwork for some very important new legislation which now says that if you are an influencer you have to say it's a paid advertisement so that's why you see the little hashtags on instagram and twitter and the little pop-ups on youtube that says this is a paid endorsement so it did bring about some very needed laws as far as that goes. So 
Fire Festival was definitely a disaster. And in the end, you had a lot of businesses going out because of it. You have definitely had the booking company that helped with the music because all the musicians pulled out for lack of payment and just knowing it was going to be a shit show. And so that company, Prestige Booking, got caught up in the whole fire thing and people associated them with fire. Wouldn't use them anymore, so they went out of business. Jerry Media had a huge backlash from because they said they knew that it was a disaster and they should have stopped marketing it at the least at the most put out a statement saying we cannot endorse this anymore but they didn't because they thought they were going to get paid millions of dollars and they didn't so that really hurt them and plus the scrutiny um, of their company based on what people thought they did that was unethical and the fact it divided their management team right down the middle. Some were angry about it. Some wanted them to apologize. Some were angry at the others. Hey, you told me to stay and keep promoting it when we shouldn't have. It was just a lot of infighting. So they kind of imploded, but not before they produced a documentary on the festival for Netflix, the Netflix uh, Fire, Fire Fra uh, the Fire Festival was a Jerry Media production. They financed it, and that's why within the documentary, they go kind of easy on the Jerry Media people. Whereas the Hulu documentary, which really put some of the blame on them, was not produced by them. So you can see the two differences in the, in the documentaries. But um, as you can imagine, it was a huge curiosity. And in the end, a lot of the major players like Grant, Billy's second, second command, was given a light sentence of like... Uh, a few months in prison and then a seven-year ban of ever being an executive officer at a company and Billy himself was sentenced to six years in federal prison for wire fraud for the whole wire transfer thing plus paying restitution of 26 million dollars to the investors and he's sitting in prison right now plus a ban on ever being an executive officer but Billy wasn't done while waiting for his trial and waiting for his um, sentencing, he could not resist one more scam. So he started the whole New York VIP access scam with a dude named uh, Frank. And basically he was targeting the people he had from the Fire Festival mailing list. He would send them these emails and texts saying, hey, do you want tickets to the Oscars? Do you want tickets to the... Um, Grammys? Do you want tickets to Hamilton? Do you want tickets to Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, The Masters? All of this stuff where tickets are really hard to get. He was offering like these VIP packages. If you do, hit us up. First come, first serve. Basically, he was just trying to scam more money because a lot of the events that he was promoting, you can't buy tickets for. The Met Gala, the uh, Masters, those kind of things, those are exclusive tickets that are actually sent invitation only. So there was no way he was going to get those tickets. So anybody that paid for him just never got their tickets. And he was actually able to scam an additional like $250,000 off of people to get these exclusive tickets. So all I can say about that is a fool born every minute, a sucker born every minute. But he was never prosecuted for that because he was already under a sentence for uh, the previous crime. So one final scam. And uh, what do you guys think? Do you think Fire Festival was an actual scam from the beginning? Or do you think it was just a festival that he did want to put on to promote his Fire app, which actually went under, of course, as a result of this. He actually just dissolved the business, laid off all the employees. Um, do you think it was actually a legitimate festival that he wanted to put on and it just got way out of hand or it was a scam from the beginning. I'm going to say that why New York VIP access to me was a scam from the beginning. I'm going to say the fire festival, he actually had intentions of doing it, and doing it right. It just devolved into a mess when he got in over his head because he had no idea how to run a festival at all. But he's sitting in prison. I think he got off light with six years, but, um, People are saying he's already teaching business courses in college. So it just goes to prove in the United States, all we value more than power is money. So anyway, what do y'all think? Like, comment, share, subscribe. Let me know if you thought the, if you think the festival was a scam or just it got way out of hand. Anyway, you can also Google a lot of this. All these, both the documentaries, the Netflix and the Hulu one are still out there. Um, 
people are always interested in what happened. Some of the locals in the Bahamas still haven't been paid. Um, the owner of Exuma Point, uh, Point Bar and Grill, Marianne, she was actually able to do, she actually had to dip into her own savings and pay the people that work for her and pay her food vendors for what happened to the tune of about $50,000. Uh, of her own savings, her her nest egg, and she was able to recoup most of that, if not all of that. I think she recouped almost two hundred thousand dollars through a, a GoFundMe. So she's okay, and I'm glad because she seemed like a really nice lady. But a lot of the locals on the island were never paid, and some of them had to leave because they had gone out and helped Billy really recruit people, and so people were coming to their door now wanting payment. So a lot of them had to leave their homes. So. It just ruined a lot of people, and Ja Rule and Billy McFarland and Grant are never allowed to do business in the Bahamas again, banned permanently by the government. So, that's bad. Anyway, guys, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. I really appreciate you tuning in. Ketosis, y'all, and Tracy Barkley, Keto Comic, out.